Good morning. Good to see you on this uh, Lord's Day morning. And I am so thankful for Sister Tina. Didn't she do another good job? Uh, we appreciate her and her faithfulness in teaching our children. And uh, you've been listening to her for weeks. I think you can agree with me that your children is in good hands. And uh, we thank God for that. Now, we're going to go back to our series on the order of the resurrection. Now, I've had a lot of good comments, and some of you have given us some compliments. And I thank you for that. That does encourage us uh, when we get some comments and compliments, because I am trying my best to teach you what the Bible says about certain truths in the Bible. And we are talking about the order of the resurrection. I think we've told you that we do not believe in a general resurrection. And a little later, we're going to teach you that we don't believe in a general judgment. Now, uh, some of the old timers used to teach, and even some today, a general resurrection and a general judgment. Uh, in other words, uh, we'll put the sheep on one side and the goats on the other side, and, and that's it. Well, that is a resurrection, and that is a judgment. But, ladies and gentlemen, that's not the last judgment, and we'll be teaching that a little bit more as we get in. But let's, let's kind of review where we've been, then take you up to where we want to start today. We're talking about the order of the resurrection. I want you to go back in your Bibles, so just for a little review, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verses 20 through 23. The Bible said, but now is Christ risen from the dead. Aren't you glad that he's alive? And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man, now notice this, in his order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Now, let's look at the Lord's first resurrection. Now, let's look at the order again. The first resurrection, first of all, is Jesus Christ. He is the first fruit. He came out of the grave Bodily, I believe in a bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus, not a spiritual resurrection, a bodily resurrection. And because he came out of the grave bodily, thank God that uh, we can preach faith. Thank God that we can preach uh, faithfulness. Thank God that we can tell people they will be a resurrection of the dead one day and that we all have hope. In Christ. If there's no resurrection, we have no faith. Our faith's vain. We're still in our sins. And there'll be no resurrection of our loved ones that have left. Now, let's continue. So when we talk about the order, uh, we're talking about Christ. I'm talking about the order of the first resurrection. He's number one. Then we showed you in Matthew 27 and verse 52, uh, 53. Uh, I won't read all those verses, but I'll read the last verse, the Bible said, well, the last two verses, and the graves were open, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, this is many Old Testament saints. When Jesus died on the cross, there was an earthquake. The veil of the temple was ripped from top to bottom. You say, why? Why? top to bottom. That means God rent the veil. God made the way. God has a plan. And thank God, I'm about to shout right there. And there was an earthquake. And, and when that earthquake, the, the graves open of many of the Old Testament saints. And when the, then those Old Testament saints came out of the grave after Christ resurrected from the dead. And they went in to the holy city, Jerusalem, and then, I believe, at his ascension, up 
into heaven and they even appeared to people. Could you imagine? Boy, I'm about to shout right here. Could you imagine the people in Jerusalem that were their relatives saw them when they walked into the holy city? I want you to know there was some shouting going on. Now, number three, uh, let's, let's move on in this order. The rapture church. That's the uh, third in the order of the first resurrection. Uh, I'll just read one of the passages. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say, unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together in the air, in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. That is the rapture of the church. That is the resurrection of the believer, those that have passed on. Now, let me explain something. Now, I, I, I don't want to get in a lot of detail because I've got a lot of material to teach today, but I want to stop just a moment. Here's what happens when you die as a believer. When you die as a believer, your inner man, the soul spirit, will go to heaven. I will believe, I believe they will be in a body. Now, not their new body. But the Bible said if this earthly tabernacle dissolved, we have a building of God not made with hands eternal in the heaven. So what I am saying to you is that they'll be able to see each other. Now, it won't be the best. The best doesn't come until their body's resurrected. Here's what happens. That the resurrection of the believer, now let me go over this a little th more thoroughly. When you die, your soul spirit goes to heaven and your body goes to the earth and your body is asleep. Then at, when the trumpet sounds and the archangel's voice your body will come out of the grave. you reunited with that real man. And there'll be, a hallelujah, a resurrection and be like Jesus Christ. Now, that happens. Let me make it clear. That happens prior to the tribulation period. See, I personally believe this. And I'm, I'm boy, I'm bogging down. Uh, I personally believe this, that a pre-tribulation rapture. But I believe that there actually is a gap between the rapture and the tribulation. I believe there will be some things happen prior to the tribulation, after the church is raptured, to get the world ready for the tribulation. Now, I don't think it's a long gap, but I think you're going to see the two witnesses, I believe, even raised during that time. Now, that's my theory, and that's my belief. Now, thank God for the resurrection of Christ. Thank God for a premillennial, pre-tribulation teaching of this. Church, we're not going through, through the wrath to come. The Bible said we've been saved from the wrath to come. We will not go through the tribulation period. There will be a rapture of the church. You ought to shout and praise him for that. Now, Let's go to the fourth in the order. And I, I try to promise myself I wouldn't bog down, and I'm trying not to. But I'm trying to be real, give you great explanation of the Scripture. Then in Revelation chapter 11, and verse 11 and 12, we see two witnesses rise. Now, I'll kind of explain the verses. You've got them there before you. Uh, they will arise, and they will preach. I believe the 144,000 will be saved because of their preaching. I, I believe that m uh, many uh, other believers will be saved because of their preaching. And 
Then they're going to be in Jerusalem. They are going to be killed right before everybody. Somebody said, well, who are they? They're Moses and Elijah, my belief is. The Bible even says Elijah will come before that great and terrible day of the Lord. And they will be preaching. They will giving the, the gospel out. And then they die. And they are in the street of Jerusalem for three and a half days. The whole world watches them. They, hey, the, you know what the world does? They start having a black Christmas. They give Christmas gifts celebrating the death of these two witnesses. Evidently, these old boys must have stirred their nest. Hey, preacher, you ain't worth a nickel if you can't stir somebody's nest. You're not worth a nickel if you can't uh, get people looking at their sin. And I want you to know they were hated. And I want to tell my preacher friends and the preachers in my church, don't wait for everybody to love you. Don't think that everybody's going to just pat you on the back all the time and you're the best thing since sliced bread. The truth of it is most people hate the gospel and hate you because you preach the gospel. Amen. And they're going to die and then God's going to call them and say, come up hither and they're going to be resurrected, resurrected and uh, hallelujah and that world will see them go up out of here. Uh, at that time. Now, let's go on to the fifth order in the order of the first resurrection, and the, uh, that's the Old Testament saints. Now, I told you that the Old Testament saints were going to be resurrected at the end of the tribulation, and part of them, or some of them, or the wave offering that fulfilled Leviticus, they were resurrected, as the Bible said, when Christ was resurrected. But this, the rest of the Old Testament saints, will not come until after the time of Jacob's trouble. The Bible said in Daniel 12, 1 and 2, I'll read that again. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince was standing for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even at the, the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one of them that shall be found in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake, some to everlasting life, and some to, uh, to shame and everlasting contempt. And that is after the time of Jacob's trouble. At the end of the tribulation, Israel will be resurrected. They will stand before God. I'll teach that in a little while or as we get into this in the next week or so and show you that in the Bible. And that'll be the resurrection of the Old Testament. Now, during the tribulation period, and I want you now to go to the sixth in the order of the first resurrection, and that is the martyred saints. Now, in Revelation chapter number 20, and I'll, I'll read this. I want you to look at it with me. And verse number four through six, and I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and that with which worship not the beast, neither his image, neither have received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not until the thousand years were finished. This is the resurrection. So the, during the tribulation period, by the results of the preaching of the 144,000 and the preaching of the two witnesses, many people are going to get saved. They will not take the mark of the beast 666. Now, let me stop a moment. Oh, I, I bawl down every time I get into teaching. Right now, I get more questions. You know, they're right now uh, talking about putting a chip in your hand to f attract you after this Cronola virus. They're, they're talking about GPS tracking. Now, somebody asked me, is that the mark of the beast? I want to say, I want to answer, no. However, I think this is good teaching. However, I do believe within my soul because 
Man is now getting acclimated to a mark, to a chip, and they're already putting chips in military people and other people to track them. And I think it will, after the church is raptured, uh, be ushered in real easily. But there's going to be some people that not take the mark of the beast and will be martyred for the cause of Christ, that will die for the cause of Christ. And the Bible said during the tribulation period, their souls will be under the altar crying out, how long, O Lord, how long? until you bring vengeance upon these people. And then the fulfillment is at the end of the tribulation, right prior to the millennial reign, they will be resurrected and they will be in the millennial reign with us. Hallelujah. Isn't that good thing? You said, I ain't never heard of that. Well, what the problem is there's a lot of people that don't rightly divide the word of truth and don't teach the Bible line upon line and precept upon precept. And that's why we got so much false junk. Somebody help me preach. Now, that concludes the first resurrection. Now, Look at Revelation chapter 20, and let's go down to verse number 10, and I will read down to verse 15. I want to introduce you to what is called the second resurrection, or the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of lost people. Now, let's look at it. Now, right now, I'm going to give you time, when I read verse 10, to hit the like button, hit the heart button, and shout, because you're going to see the end of the devil right here. You ready? Thank God. I read this every once in a while. Uh, by the way, uh, I remember, uh, uh, I, I like to read. I, I'm, a, I'm a reader. I read fiction. I read everything. But you know, sometimes when I read fiction, and my hero is going through a hard time. Jared, you know how your hero goes through a hard time. And you get a little nervous that this book ain't going to end up right. You know what I do sometimes in reading? I cheat. I go back to the back of the book, find out that my hero won. Woo! I want you to know something. Every once in a while, when things get tough, when things get rough, when I feel like I, I'm not going to make it, I want you to know what I do. I go to this verse in the back of the book and have me a little shout and spell and get praising God and giving him the glory. Now, let me give it to you, and I'll read it to you, and maybe you'll shout a little bit. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Somebody ought to just right now shout. You ought to just comment, hallelujah, Uh, amen, praise the Lord. That one that has tormented you ever since you've been saved, that one that has tempted you, that one that has drunk you through the mud, that one that has hated you and and has accused you before God, aren't you glad the accuser of the brothers going into hell with the beast and the false prophet and they'll be there forever and they'll never hurt nobody again and they'll never haunt nobody again and they'll never hinder nobody again again and they'll wail glory to God I don't mean to preach brother Jared but I'm taking a little preaching spell right now because the devil that deceived us will be cast into hell and cast into the lake of fire now with that little spell I had let me go on now let's go in and let me show you the second resurrection let's look at this passage and then what I'm going to do I'm then going to broaden out our teaching. You'll see that in a moment. The Bible said, and I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead. Now when it says dead, that's lost people. Small and great. That's rich, poor, black, white, yellow, every lost person in humanity stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was opened. 
which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of him. Those things which were written in the books according to their works. Listen to this. Here's the resurrection. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their own works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I want you to know that is going to be a great and terrible day. And I want you to know if you're listening to me and you're lost today, you ought not to want to go through that. And if you don't get saved, that's where you're going. You're going, hey, if you die, you're going straight to hell and then you're going to stand before God. Where your body's going to come out of the grave and your soul is going to come out of hell and you will give account, and we're going to deal with this big time in a moment. Now, let's expand our teaching. Let's broaden it out a little bit, because that brings us to another question. Preacher, you said you didn't believe in a general resurrection. I do not. I do not believe that. I've already taught you that, and if you don't know that, you're just not listening, and you don't want to know it. But I also want to tell you and I want to build upon this, there also is not a general judgment. Now, there's some people believe the Lord's coming back, and the last judgment is the judgment of the sheep and goat nations, or that's the last judgment. And you put the sheep on one side and the goats on one side, and then that's it. Well, that's not it. And you're not even... Theologically right, you are not scripturally right, you're not in right context, and I want you to know something, you're just not right at all about it. And uh, because not only is there not a general resurrection, there's not a general judgment. I showed you seven resurrections in the scripture. Six found in the first resurrection of Christ, and then one for the lost dead. Every lost person, Old and New Testament and Millennial Kingdom will stand before God at that great day of the white throne judgment. Now, you're saying, Preacher Smith, are you telling me that there's no such thing as a general judgment? That's exactly what I'm going to tell you. But I'm not just going to tell you that. I'm going to show you that. Now, uh, I'm going to show you in the Bible actually seven judgments. Seven? Seven judgments. Thank God. I, aren't you having a good time? Aren't we studying? Aren't we learning? Uh, some of you have, have your whole life thought, well, we're just going to have a general judgment and that's it and the lost here and the saved here. No, 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 no. You haven't studied your Bible. You're not rightly dividing the word of truth. You don't know the Bible if that's what you believe. It ain't no use you getting upset at me because I'm preaching the truth of the word of God. And uh, you ought to say hallelujah for a preacher that will expound the Bible and expound the truth and has studied it out and can show us in the Word of God. That's what I want to do. So, here's what I'm going to do today. <laughs> I'm going to expound some more. I'm going to show you the seven judgments, take you all the way back to the white throne, and then after I, when I get there, I'll finish up and explain it thoroughly and then be done with the series. That may take me another week of this, I would say. So let's look at the seven judgments. You said, what's the first judgment? What's the number one judgment? What comes first? I'm glad you asked. The first judgment is the believer's sins were judged at the cross. Let me say to you, the only reason John Smith is not going to hell and not going to face the white throne judgment is because there was a day upon Calvary's cross that my sin was judged there. Let's look what the Bible says. It doesn't matter what John Smith says 
or some other t- preacher says, it really matters. Just one thing matters, and it's what the saith the Bible. Amen. Let's look at it. John chapter 12, verse 31 through 33. And I'll, I'm taking sections of this, okay? Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. And look what Jesus said, verse 32. And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Look what he said. This he said, signifying what death he should die. Now go with me. If you got your Bible, all will run over now to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. And let me show you this first judgment. And that's the judgment of the believer's sins at the cross. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, here's what happened. Christ, who could not sin. Now, let me just stop right there. I might as well just, Jared, I'm just going to hit this myself. Somebody said, well, Jesus could have sinned. No, he couldn't. He couldn't sin because he wouldn't. And he wouldn't sin because he couldn't. He never sinned. He lived 33 and a half years of perfection. See, the law requires perfection from the cradle to the grave. And I want to say this to all you law keepers and works doers. You cannot do enough works and you cannot keep the whole law because the Bible says you whosoever keepeth the whole law but offendeth in one little point is guilty of it all. So we needed somebody who was able to die on the cross who never sinned, who never defiled himself, that never had one time did anything wrong and he was Christ and he died and became sin. He, he literally became sin. You, have you ever heard the word vicarious? How many of you know what vicarious means? It means substitutionary. It means Christ became your substitute. Let me go back to the Old Testament. What they did every year was this. They would come on a great day of atonement, shed blood, and they w- then they would get a what they call a scapegoat and put the hands, lay the hands, the sins of the people upon that goat, and then that goat would go out, and they would watch their sins go. But here was the problem. Their sins came back the next year. They had to repeat it over and over and over and over. But I want you to know what happened. When Jesus died on the cross, he became sin. He became the adulterer. He became the uh, the person on Porto. Yes, he did. He he became the drunkard. He he became everything that you were. Hallelujah, that what he was is going to be imputed to him. Here's what happened. The son of God became the son of man, that we that are the sons of men can become the sons of God. Somebody ought to shout. Raise your hand with me a little bit. So what he done, he judged sin upon the cross, that whosoever believeth in him and trusteth in him, and whosoever calls on his name can be saved. To many as received and gave him power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Here's what I mean. He took judgment, and the Bible said he went down into Abraham's bosom, preached to the spirits that were in prison, those that were in Hades. But see, before, oh, dear God. <laughs> Isn't this good? Before, before, the cross, everybody either went into Abraham's bosom or Hades. Lost people went into Hades. Saved people got in or those that were stayed uh, in the Old Testament uh, went in to Abraham's bosom. And there was a great gulf fix there. You remember that? Because remember when the rich man died and Lazarus died, labor, uh, Lazarus went to Abraham's bosom or paradise and the rich man went into Hades 
When Jesus died, here's what he done. He went down in, whoo, down in to Abraham's bosom, preached to those that were in hell, and also the spirits or the, the demons that were confined there, that sinned during the days of Noah, <laughs> and he preached to them. You said, why did he preach to them? Give them another chance? Oh, now that's what the Jehovah Witnesses say. That's what the Mormons say. Hey, if you die in your sin, they ain't no second chances. No, I'll tell you what he was doing. He was telling them, hey, I'm that ark in the Old Testament. I'm, <laughs> you, know when, you know when old brother Noah preached for them 120 years and preached to all you people, he was talking about me. He was proclaiming me. I, I am that one door to heaven. I, I am the ark. I am the pitch. I sh- the pitch which was, was spread on the ark on the outside and the inside was a, a kofar or atonement. And, and I am the atonement. I, I'm just telling you, I am the one that every Old Testament shattered, every Old Testament type pictured. And he will be preaching to them. And then he'll come from the grave and bring everybody in Abraham's bosom out, their souls, spirits, and take them on to heaven. And you said, what did he do? He, he judged your sin. He paid your sin. He took your sin. He became your sin offering. He became your sacrifice. He became your sin bearer. And then when he resurrected, he became your scapegoat. But I want you to know, he didn't take them away. Hallelujah. When he judged sin, he didn't take them away. Just, no, 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 not for one year. But he took them away forever. Now, I'm going to have to read the verse. Hold on. Turn to Hebrews. Turn to Hebrews. Let me read the verse. Y'all still with me out there? I hope so. Turn to Hebrews chapter number 10. When you get there, say amen. Good. Let me show you what the Bible said in verse 14. Well, I'll read from 10 to 14. The Bible said, but the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So when he was judged for sin, he sanctified us once and for all. He paid for our sin once for all. Let me go on and keep reading. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. That Old Testament system was futile. It could not take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Now listen to this. For by one offering, he had perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now I'll read another verse. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us for after that he had said before. Well, glory. Oh, glory. What are you saying, Preacher Smith? What he done at Calvary, his work and that judgment at Calvary, that that judgment for sin at Calvary, he paid it all. He he perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now, let let me explain that. When I got saved, I was sanctified on the inside once and forever, perfected. I can't sin on the inside. I, hey, hey, Armenian, if there's any Armenians listen to me, that's why I can't be lost again. Somebody help me. Jared, some more scripture. I'm going to read something else. Uh, turn up. Turn, let me show you that. Turn to First, uh, first John chapter 3. I want to show you all something. I want to I get you shouting shout before we leave here, okay? Woo. Look here. Verse 7 of First John 3. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. 
He that committed sin is of the devil. For the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now listen to this. For whosoever or whosoever is born of God, are you born again? Doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. Now, I'm bringing another doctrine out, a doctrine of eternal security. Can I tell you something? You can't be lost again because the only thing would make me lost is if I could go out and sin. But the part that's saved, the inner man cannot sin. But the, you say you're contradicting. The Bible contradicts you, preacher. The Bible says, if we say we have no sin, you make him a liar. See, there is where you don't understand the Bible. When I sin, it's not the new man that sins. It's the old man that sins. That's why when you die, the old man goes to the grave. Man, that's good preaching. Until the resurrection. See, I cannot sin inwardly. I'm sanctified inwardly once and for all. I'm progressively being sanctified outwardly. And one of these days, my whole body, soul, and spirit will be sanctified at the coming of the Lord Jesus. And none of that would be possible if he did not judge our sin at Calvary. He judged it at Calvary. He bore your sin. He was your sin bearer. Thank God. That ought to make some of you shout. You ask me why I'm happy? I'll tell you why. My sins, they're all gone. When the scoffers come and ask me where they're at, I'll tell them where. They're all under the blood of Calvary. They're gone. I remember I was preaching out in Wolf Pen. You ever heard of Wolf Pen? Well, I, I was raised around Wolf Pen. And I was preaching out there. And there's a couple of my buddies heard that I was a preach man. This has been 47 years ago. And they came out. And I'll be honest with you, what they came out for, they came out to kind of scoff and make fun of me and ridicule me. And they, when I went in, they was there, they said, oh, you used to be an old drunk. You used to be with such a wicked man. You, 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 you are a devil. And I looked at both of them. I said, but you don't know what Jesus done for me. He, he became my sin. He took my sin. I got up there and preached up there in wolf pen, preached the word of God and the gospel. And I want you to know, them, I, I watched them two school friends of mine. They were making fun while I was preaching. But about halfway through, Jared, they start getting under what I call whole leg ghost conviction. And they heard the word of God. And I preached to them about Calvary and the blood and Jesus' judgment for my sin on Calvary. And I'll tell you what happened. Uh, uh, Jacob and Joey both came up to the altar and they repented of their sin and they got saved by the grace of God and they experienced what I experienced forgiveness. My guilt is gone. Why is your guilt going, preacher? Why don't you uh, still worry about what you've done when you was a sinner boy? Because Christ judged my sin at Calvary. This is the first judgment of all. I know I bogged down, but I think we need to do this and teach this. That you know that you're saved. And let me tell you how much you're saved. You're saved to the uttermost. He bore your sin. He saved you to the uttermost because he was just. He was your substitute. He took your place. He loved you when you were unlovable. He looked beyond your faults and saw your need. He cares for you. He already paid the price. Why would you die and go to hell when the payment's been paid? Like the songwriter said, he paid it all. Now we're studying these judgments. We'll end up with the white throne judgment. We, but we had to start where it all started, where Jesus paid for our sin. And he, our sins were judged in him. At Calvary. That's why salvation's a free gift. I hope you've learned something today. I'll continue these seven judgments next week. 
I hope you're learning. I, I want to teach you. Now, let's get ready to worship. We're going to worship here in four or five minutes, and let me pray. Our Father, thank you for the listeners. Thank you for Sunday school today. Thank you for the liberty I had. Now, bless our morning worship here in four or five minutes, and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.